Hello, good day to you all. How's it going? I'm Sean David. Welcome back to the show. Let's talk some old school NBA. In today's episode, we got a true NBA legend, four time NBA All Star, Mark Price. Mark, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. Good to see you. Good to see you too, man. Now, you've been on my show, I think, a week ago, and we already highlighted one game where you were, when you were playing against the Chicago Bulls, and you, yeah, beat the Bulls by a large number. But I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into your career and actually also ask you a question be even before your NBA career. I wanted to know who was the guy that you admired the most? Which NBA player was your NBA player even before you played in the NBA? Well, you know, I'm, I go way back, so, you know, I don't know if this names would be familiar to, to other people, but uh, when I was 10 years old, a lot of people don't know, my dad was an assistant coach for the uh, Phoenix Suns back in 1974, 75 era. And uh, there was a guy on their team uh, named Dick Van Arsdale. Of course. Who uh, played for the Suns. And he had a twin brother, Tom, who also played in the NBA, but... Uh, You know, he was a guy that I watched, you know, and when I was a 10 year old, even, you know, when the other kids were running around the arena, my mom said I would just sit in my seat and I would just like be glued on these guys. And then I would go home and then try to practice what I had seen. But, uh, you know, Dick Van Arsdale was probably kind of the first NBA guy that, uh, you know, it's because I got to see him every night, obviously with the Phoenix Suns, but uh, he was kind of a guy early on that I was like, you know what, if he can do that, I think I can too. I'm a little bit surprised. I was expecting somebody like Isaiah because the uh, the playing style reminded me a little um, of you. But okay, it's always interesting to get this kind of information. Now, we already touched that topic the last time that you were basically, yeah, I don't want to say overlooked in your draft class, but I'm pretty certain that many teams were kind of mad when they saw how great you turned out. Uh, but Back in the days, for a rookie, it was hard to receive any minutes. So I wanted to know, how tough was it for you waiting for your turn coming off the bench in your rookie season? Well, you know, it was a, it was a big learning curve. Uh, I had a veteran guy on the Cavaliers named John Bagley, uh, you know, who was, who was a, a good player and, you know, had been around the league. And so, you know, I, I was just always a student of the game. It didn't matter what my situation was. And so I just tried to learn as much as I possibly could and take advantage of the minutes. You know, I I got pretty good minutes my first year coming off the bench. And uh, unfortunately that first year, I also had an emergency appendicitis uh, in the middle of the season that, that, that knocked me out for a month. So that kind of slowed down my uh, progression a little bit, uh, but I was able to get back in shape after that first season. I had really locked in and learned. And I think the biggest thing that happened for me that first year was that I knew, even though it was more limited minutes and, and there were some ups and downs, but I left that first year knowing that, you know what, I can play in this league, I belong, and I can even be really good in this league. And so I went and started working on things and, and really came back that next season in the best shape of my life. And uh, they had traded John Bagley. Uh, they had drafted Kevin Johnson. And Kevin was negotiating his contract for two weeks. And so I am I had a two-week window, you know, in training camp where I was the only point guard there. And by the time Kevin showed up, I was rolling. And uh, <laughs> Lenny let me win the spot. And then, uh, you know, they eventually traded Kevin to Phoenix, who uh, Kevin had a great career as well. So I, I was glad I got him early. <laughs> in his career because he was a great player too. Uh, I've, I've seen an interview with Kevin Johnson who said, and I don't know how old the interview is, but he said um, that he really believed at first that he could take your spot and if you would have one single game where you wouldn't play to your best abilities that he would get that spot but you never seemed to give him that chance like like he was waiting for a chance but you kept your your level at a constant high level and um yeah it's it's unbelievable that that a team has two incredible point guards on, on the same team because Kevin was incredible you've been incre incredible just to imagine if he would have stayed maybe the the cast would have had a chance to work something out playing with two point guards the same uh, rotation that you had with Ron Harper I think you and Kevin could have played well alongside each other 
Yeah, it was just, uh, I think it was a different era, a different time where most of the most of the two guards back then, you were talking six, seven, six, eight, you know, really uh, big, big guards at the two position. I think, you know, flash forward to today's era, you know, that, that certainly we could have played together and, and, and been very effective because we were both really good offensive players. And, and yet we were different style players. And I think we could have complemented each other well. Yes. But I think, uh, you know, it all worked out for both people. Uh, Kevin went on and had a great career. And I think you know, I was able to make my run in Cleveland. And so uh, it worked out well for both of us. Now, in your second season, when you became a starter, you basically played on an all-star level already. Um, I wanted to know from all the point guards that you played against at that time, let's say in the mid 80s, who was the one guy that you felt was your toughest matchup? Well, I think uh, you mentioned his name earlier, but uh, Isaiah Thomas Uh, being at Detroit, they were uh, making their run with the bad boys and, and, and that whole, uh, you know, uh, years there where they won a couple championships. And, and uh, you know, Isaiah, we were in the same division, so we played against each other six times a season. So, the you know, we, we kind of developed a, a, a pretty good rivalry there. And he was a guy, obviously, that, uh, that I look forward to playing against. And he was such a good player and a challenge. Uh, along with, you know, I mean, every every team had a great point guard. I mean, it's the NBA, but, you know, I think uh, Isaiah was the guy at that time that uh, was somebody that I looked up to as a player and, and really, uh, you know, wanted to play well when we played against them. Now, back in the 80s, we had some of the greatest rivalries in NBA history. Actually, there were so many rival great rivalries. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Boston Celtics and Larry Bird because they also been in the Eastern Conference uh, at that time. Um, and doing my research, I actually saw that you had some great shootout, uh, shootout nights with Larry Bird. Um, what was it like playing against the Celtics and what was it like playing against Larry? Well, I mean, he really was, you know, his nickname, Larry Legend, you know, he, he really was such a legend and such a great player and, and uh, you know, the things that he could do at his size. And he, he really was one of the first, you know, kind of big guys, 6'10 or whatever, that, you know, shot a lot of three-point shots, stretched the defense, could play inside, outside. Such a great passer, a smart basketball player, uh, you know, and we, you know, it was a privilege to get to play in that era that I played in and to get to play against so many of those great players. And, you know, we actually, Larry's last game happened to be against us in the Eastern Conference Finals oh. uh, the year we got there. And uh, so I like to tell people that I ended Larry's career, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it was, uh, he, he, you know, was such a, you know, he just, when he was in the game and you were playing against them, he had such an impact on it in so many ways. In your second season, you finished the season shooting 50% from the field and 48% from the three-point line, uh, three line, which is unbelievable. You already mentioned that you worked on your game and worked on specific things to improve your game. Was shooting really something that you noticed pretty early? Okay, that will be my, my bread and butter. That is something that you would have to work on or was that something that evolved naturally? Well, um, you know, it's funny because really my bread and butter uh, was the pick and roll, playing out of the pick and roll offense with Brad Doherty uh, in particular, but, but a lot of my Cavs teammates. And the funny thing was, was during my four-year college career, I never ran a pick and roll one single time. And so <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, it was something that looking back on it, I, I used to tell Coach Kremens, my college coach, I was like, Why didn't you run pick and rolls? I'd have been killing people <laughs> out here, you know, but uh, it just wasn't a style that we played in college, but it uh, was something that, that morphed into to my game when naturally. And, you know, it was something that I didn't even think twice about because it was such a natural part of uh, my game. And I was able to shoot the ball behind screens, stretch defenses. I think my ability to shoot the ball really put pressure on the defense playing out of the pick and roll because they either had to guard me or, you know, you had a big all-star player rolling to the basket like Brad Doherty mm. that they had to had to worry about as well. So it was pretty impossible to guard, uh, you know, and, and teams tried a lot of different ways to stop it. But uh, that was our go-to, and uh, we did really well with that. It's funny that you mentioned that uh, 
that the pick and roll was your bread and butter. Um, splitting the pick and roll. Seriously, I, I'm a basketball coach. I've been coaching for so many years and I got to be honest. I don't want to lie. I have to be honest. Up until like four years ago, I didn't even know that you can split a pick and roll. And once I did some research and because I always remembered you as this great shooter, creative passer, but I never, never really paid too much attention to the uh, splitting the pick and roll part. How do you come up with that? Because I don't know any other player who used to do that in the 80s. Well, it was, uh, you know, a lot of people give me credit for kind of being the first guy to do it. Uh, whether or not that's true, I don't know. I'd never really seen it happen either. But uh, I'd become so effective at shooting the ball coming off of pick and rolls. The defenses started really adjusting to that and being a lot more aggressive, trying to trap me off screens, uh, really jumping their big guy out really high to try to like redirect me coming off of screens. Teams are trying all kinds of different things. And I'll never forget the first time it happened because we had played a back to back with Philadelphia and I was playing against the great Mo Cheeks, you mm -hmm. know, for Philly. And my rookie season at Cleveland, I had, I think my career high, something like 29 points. I was coming off screens, just making threes like crazy. And so we have to go, you know, which we did in the old days a lot. You played the same team the next night, you know, in their arena. So they obviously weren't going to let me do that again. And so, the, I mean, when I get in the game, they're just like jumping me like crazy. And so one time I come off the screen and their big guy jumped so far out, it like opened up. It looked like it opened up like the Red Sea, you know, <laughs> right there. And I just kind of instinctively just kind of threw a pass a little bit through that and caught it and shot a little shot at the free throw line and uh as we were going back down the court mo cheeks was like man that was a sweet move <laughs> you know and so like i locked that away and i was like at that point i started working on it you know i kind of oh. said well i can use this i can really make this an effective part of my games especially how the defenses are trying to play me now so that's kind of how it came about and uh you know i just kept doing it and doing it and really got to the point every time I came off the screen you could hear the other coach saying don't let him split you don't let him split you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah back in back in the late 1980s you became an NBA all-star officially now um, who were you excited about the most to play with him like like was there a certain player where you were like super excited like hey I'm playing with this spe uh, specific person Well, it was just, you know, so much fun. Like I said, I played in such a great era. There were so many great players. I mean, obviously guys like Larry Bird you, in the Eastern Conference, you had, you know, when I first got in the, you know, Julius Irving, guys like that. And, and uh, you know, of course the rise of Michael Jordan, he was starting to make his rise, Charles Barkley. I mean, there was just so many great, you know, personalities and great players during that era that it was just, a, it was a blast. It's like, Like, really? I'm like playing with getting a chance to play with all these guys and, you know, in an all-star game, I was like, you know, you know, shaking my head like this is this is unreal. So it was a dream come true. And, and just a, it was a, it was a lot of fun to to one be voted in. You know, I was never, you know, picked as a starter, you know, uh, but I was always voted in by the coaches, which to me meant a lot more even because they really knew what guys were effective in, 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 in by place putting me on the all-star team. That meant a lot to me. Back in 1991, the dream team is selected. Do me a favor, in all honesty, were you disappointed that you weren't on the team? Well, of course, you know, I, I mean, obviously I felt like I was good enough to be on that team. And, But there's only, I mean, there's only so many guys, you know, that can be can be on one team. And, and obviously you can't, other than the one college player and Christian Leitner, you know, you can't really pick a guy off of that off of that first dream team and say, hey, they didn't belong. I mean, there's 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 several a lot of a lot of the guys like myself that were eventually picked for dream team, too, you know, could have all made a case for being on that team as well. But but uh No, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, I have great respect for all those guys that were on that team. And like I said, I mean, it's just weren't, weren't enough spots for everybody. <laughs> yeah, very true. But you were, you've been on the U.S. team in 1994, weren't you? That's correct. Yeah. <sighs> Basketball historian, yes. Uh, 
<laughs> now, um, one sad part about your career was that you had to battle many, many injuries. Um, same happened to your Cleveland Cavaliers teams. Uh, Brett was was uh, got hurt. Ron got traded. Okay, different situation. But it's it seemed like players that get drafted with the Cavs at that time always had some injuries to battle. Um, but looking back, who or what team do you think was the best Cavs team that you played on? Uh, no question. I think the the team that uh, you know gets a lot of storyline because the the year Michael hit the shot was really a first round series uh, that season. And I really felt like we were a contender to win the whole thing uh, with Ron Harper, with the two guard, you know, uh, Brad, Larry Nance. We had Hot Rod Williams, Craig Elo that were coming off the bench. We were really deep. Um, and unfortunately, you know, injuries hit us at the wrong time. Most people don't realize that the first round series back then were just five games. And so uh, it was a little bit easier to pull an upset. And, uh, you know, you lose one game you shouldn't. It can put you in a, in a bind. And we had actually beaten the Chicago Bulls that year six times. And uh, we were just a dominant team. And I had pulled my hamstring. I wasn't even able to play in the first game of that series. And Chicago stole that game in Cleveland. I, I then came back and played the last four, kind of hobbled. But... Uh, we were still able to get it to that fifth game, beat Chicago in, in game four in Chicago to bring it back to Cleveland. And then Michael, of course, hit the shot. It was an unbelievable series. But I really believe that team was probably our best team. And then after that season, of course, you know, the infamous Ron Harper trade uh, that, that sent him. And I felt like once we lost Ron, because he was that one kind of slasher type you know, athletic player that could just take it and get you a bucket, you know, at the rim. Uh, we had a lot of really, really good pieces, but we really missed the kind of player that he was. And and uh, he fits so well with our roster and with me in particular in the backcourt. Yes. So um, after that, we were, we were always very good and very competitive still, but we didn't quite have that piece to get us over the hump. I agree. Also my favorite cast team. So we're <laughs> definitely on, on the same page. Now, since your retirement, you've been pretty busy. You've been coaching, and I actually was wondering, are there any plans on returning to coaching? Because with the way the game is played today, uh, who would be a better coach for today's game than you? Well, I obviously love teaching the game. I've been coaching you know, for a long time now. Uh, this year, I haven't been with the team. It's been a little bit of a, with all the craziness of, uh, of COVID and just the cancellation of the season and then the bubble thing and all that. So I've just kind of been sitting sitting back from afar, kind of watching things, what's, what's happening and uh, you know, just waiting to see what opportunities uh, are there next year. Uh, but I definitely still have a great passion for the game and, and love teaching the game. And, and if the right opportunity presented itself, I certainly would, would be interested in, in, uh, in getting back into coaching again. What about working for the Cavs? Because <laughs> I, be, yeah, because I personally feel like it, um, there are certain players when you hear the name, you always have them in your mind with one specific team and to me it just feels natural that certain players should be coaching or at least working for a, certain, a specific type um, specific type of club you are a 100% Cleveland Cavalier so were there ever any yeah any thoughts about coaching for the Cavs well you know I love the Cavs organization uh, you know they know that I mean the city of Cleveland knows I mean like you said anybody that ever associates me with the NBA, you know, always associates me with the Cavaliers. My jersey's hanging in their rafters. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, so it, uh, I have great, great fondness for, for the Cavs organization. Obviously, anytime if an opportunity presented itself to, to come along and, and, and work with the Cavs organization, and I would certainly be, be thrilled to, uh, to have that opportunity. But, uh, you know, so, you know, we'll see. You never know what what'll happen down the road. And, and but uh, you know, that relationship I've always kept close there. The fans in Cleveland, we've always had a really, really, really special relationship. And uh, I love the city of Cleveland and the Cavs organization. 
Dear Cleveland Cavaliers, be smart. I'm already helping you here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Now, Mark, before I let you go, uh, a current project of yours. Um, actually, I was super, super happy to find out how the project turned out and how your t-shirts looks. You have a t-shirt project. Can you tell us something about that project? Yeah, I, uh, I came together with a company called the Cleveland Cl Clothing Company uh, in the Cleveland area. Uh, of course, during this COVID time, I was, we just, I was talking to some friends in, in Cleveland and he had a connection with, with this guy and he knew the t-shirt the company. And we were like, we need to do a project together just to, uh, you know, raise some funds, donate some money to the Cleveland Food Bank. And so they developed and designed this Mark Price for Three, which a guy named Howie Chizik used to announce it at the games all the time when I played. Mark Price for Three. And so they made this, uh, you know, Mark Price for Three t-shirt. And uh, it did extremely well. People, uh, people were real excited about it. It sold out however many they made. And so, you know, we decided to reboot that and uh, put it out there again. So if anybody is interested in a cool looking t-shirt, a Mark Price Three t-shirt, uh, it's available. Okay, I will post the link underneath the video or the podcast. So if you want to purchase this great shirt, check the link out in the description. Mark, it was great having you on the show. Well, it's always great spending time with you. I always appreciate uh, history, NBA, officiados, and uh, you know your stuff. And I respect that and I appreciate, uh, enjoy our conversations.